being a British guy in 2015 is not easy. 21st century pressures are changing. No way. The way we live. Women are seen as superior to men. The way we love. If you are a Muslim, you cannot be gay. That's as simple as that. Even the way we look. That silicone. Yeah. This is mental. In this series, I'm traveling to the extreme edge of modern British masculinity. I mean, what's your body gonna be like at 30? I'd be lucky to get that. If you know that, then what are you doing? In an era of gay rights, marriage, even parenthood, some Brits still struggle to accept homosexuality. A woman and a woman, and a man and a man, I just don't believe that. The male, the female, even the animals, they are like this. And some call being gay a decision, a bad decision. I'm sorry to cut you, but you're comparing homosexuality to stealing and I'm to... Not an, uh, I'm not equating, I'm not equating. I know, I know, you're comparing. But for those who feel they have no choice, the effects can be devastating. He kicked my bedroom door open. He was like, I want you out of my house by midnight. And we didn't speak for three years. Leaving gay men under attack from their own community. Sometimes I love bottles thrown at my head. I love people saying, oh, you fatty man, go die. And even their own family. My own mother said to me, if you murdered someone, I'd still accept you. But you being gay, I can't accept you for that. Gay marriage became legal in Britain in 2014, but in some black and Asian communities, homosexuality itself remains taboo. South London has the largest population of black men in the UK, and it's my home. So it seems like a good place to start. I'm gonna meet uh, a guy called Max today in his barber shop. Now, if you've ever actually been to a black barber's, you'll know that it's the best place for debate, it's the best place for shit talking. And talking about something like homosexuality in a black barber's, for me, will, will stir up some real honest answers and potentially start a conversation that I've never had or heard in a place like this. Max? Hey. What's going on, brother? How, you, How you doing? Max's parents are from West Africa, just like mine. What age would you say you realised that you were actually a gay man? Um, to be honest, I guess deep down I always knew in the back of my mind, but it wasn't up until the age of 18 that I accepted it within myself. One day I kind of just, I don't know what the trigger was, I just kind of woke up and I was like, yeah, this isn't working for me, like, I'm, I'm gay. Yeah. yeah. How long did it take you to go from that realisation to actually approaching that conversation with your father? Well, I, the, I didn't actually have that conversation with my father. You didn't? No. Right. One day, the pastor of the church came up to me and she, she asked me if I was gay. And at this point in time, my philosophy was, like, I'm not going to tell people, but if somebody asks me, I'm not going to deny it. And I said, yeah. And then she, she asked me if, I, if my dad knew. Yeah. And I said, I haven't told him yet. And at the end of the conversation, she said to me, if you don't tell him, I will. So what she went on to tell him off she, the back yeah, of you yeah. not taking that week to tell yeah. him. And how did he react? It wasn't great. He kicked my bedroom door open, gave me this long 10 minute lecture, and he was like, I want you out of my house by midnight. And we didn't speak for three years. Max tells me they now talk just two to three times a year. It's fair to say my, my father doesn't know who I am right now. Yeah. Based on your experience, what would you say is most commonplace when it comes to West African parents and how parents react to that news? Do you know what? I think a lot of, a lot of people from, from, from Africa are very religious. Yeah. And I think that's where it starts. Excuse me, auntie, <laughs> where are you from? I'm part of Liberia, Sierra Leone. Okay, and how long have you been in the UK? 16 years. 16 years, mm. right, okay, now that's your little boy who's getting his hair cut, right? Yeah. What is your attitude towards homosexuality? For instance, if your son came out as gay, how do you think you'd react? It's quite hard because African people, like you said, something that is a cultural thing. Mm. First and foremost, I will ask my son, why? Because for us, to be quite honest, they think it's a big, big saboon for them. Mm. It will be so, so hard. Even for me, 
Because in the first place, I don't even get it. Gay. I don't even get it. Excuse me. Excuse me, brother. It, it's fairly obvious what your religious beliefs are. But um, culturally, I'm really interested in your point of view. First of all, where are your family from? What's your background? Well, my parents are from St. Lucia. You're West Indian? Yeah, okay. I'm West Indian. Were they born there and came over? Yeah. And you were born here, I take it? I was it? born here, yeah. And how old are you now? I'm 30 you now. You're 30 years old. What are your views on homosexuality? You to your way, me to my way. But me, I don't agree with this one. A lot of good comes from men and uh, women, you know, like... Uh, being together, brother, you understand? Not to put it like this way, but even the animals, they are like this, you understand? Like the male, the female, even the plants are like this, you know? What would you do if your daughter actually came home and told you that she was homosexual? I mean, to begin with, I'd be heartbroken. To begin with, I'd be heartbroken, personally. I would have the hope maybe it's a phase, it's something, and... Uh, does that mean that you believe that homosexuality is something that a person chooses? People are choosing to become uh, homosexual. <laughs> what would you say to that? I think it's almost, and no offence to you, but it, it, it's, like, it's probably the most ridiculous thing anyone can say that someone would choose to be gay. If you look at the world we live in, being gay isn't, like, it's, it's, it's never been a good thing. It's never been something easy. So why would... Why would anyone at any age wake up one day and say, do you know what, I want to be a homosexual so that the people in the street can throw rocks at me and so that I could be rejected by my family? I don't know, because obviously you could be with a woman. That relationship may not have worked out. Maybe she done your head in, maybe this, you know, like she was, you know, she was a bad woman, she oppressed you, you know, she made you feel low, all this stuff. But there's many out here, there's many out here, the good one may have come after this one. Do you think that your versions of happiness can exist side by side? I think so. It's like, if you, if you go to a restaurant with somebody and one person wants to order pizza, <laughs> but the other person wants to have chips, what will make one person happy is the chips. What will make another person happy is the pizza. We can sit at the same table and we can eat. We can probably be in the same restaurant, but he will have his table there and he will be, you know, doing his thing on his table there, and I will be on my table over there. I've always sort of said that the attitude towards the LGBT community in the Afro-Caribbean community are massively different based on, uh, on generation. In talking to Ibrahim, I realised that it's not necessarily the case for, um, for everyone. You know, Ibrahim is only a couple of years younger than me, and his mindset couldn't be any more different, even though he was born and raised here. It's hard to ignore religion in any discussion on homosexuality, especially among black communities in the UK. Seven out of 10 black Britons come from Christian homes, and over a quarter of all churchgoers in London are black. Until the age of nine, I was one of them. My uh, very faint memories of going to church were uh, Pentecostal. So, um, you know, it was lots of singing, lots of dancing. Uh, there were a lot of people catching the Holy Ghost. I'll never forget Auntie Linda catching the Holy Ghost and breaking a chair. That was a good time. Um, <laughs> we're going to a, a Seventh-day Adventist church, which I've never been to before. So um, I don't actually know what to expect. Seventh-day Adventist followers believe in a literal interpretation of the Bible. And they practice what they preach. No smoking, no alcohol, and no gambling. But does that list include being gay? How you doing, sir? How you doing? You all right? Um, I'm here to meet Pastor Michael B. Is that him there? Is that his picture? Yeah. Ah, let's see. What's your name, sorry? Alan. Pardon what? Alan. Alan, nice. Um, what are you handing out here? You didn't give me one. No, sorry. Why I'm didn't I get one, Alan? Because he was talking to me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, here he is. Oh, there you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hello. Hello. Pastor B. Pastor Michael. Michael B. How you doing? I'm Michael Reggie. Michael Mbui. Michael Mbui. Yes. How you doing? I'm very fine, thank you. Nice to meet you. Uh, yes. Thank you for having us down in your church today. Okay. Appreciate it. Thank you. Um, when are you, uh, you going to be up and uh, I'm not preaching today. Today, today I'm not? just a supervisor. Yeah, the young people are doing the programme today. All right. Yes. Okay. So, Pastor Michael has a young team that he's training up. 
The man leading today's service is Pastor Andrew. Nice to meet you too. Nice to meet you. Just out of interest, how old are you? You look quite I'm 27. young. 27. 27? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you're going to be up there running things today? Nah, not, not running things, but just giving a little humble word, man. Yeah. Yeah. And so how long have you been doing, um, been doing this then? How long have you been preaching? To be honest, I've been preaching since I was 16 years old. I, I left the church and I came back. You know, when you say up. you left the church, what does that mean? Like in the sense when you're growing up in church, yes. and even though I come here one day a week, during the week I was, I was, you know, otherwise occupied with other things. So Such in the sense, you know, girls, you know, money, drugs, like you name it. Living in an wow. area in London, that's it's almost impossible not to get involved in them things. We need okay. to get yeah. Money. Yeah. So no problem. We need a preacher in here for Man, a, a preacher that can talk a lot is a good thing, surely. <laughs> that's what you want, isn't it? Nice to meet you both. There is quite a lot of young people here. There's quite a lot of people under the age of 25 here. And I imagine that he's probably a big part of that. My sermons are not this is just me, like it or leave it, I'm an honest person. I'm breaking it down. The world are seeing God how we present him. People outside, the only God they see is you. And if we show them that God is like this, you can't do this and you can't do that and look at you, you're going to hell. If we show them that that is what God is like, then they're not going to want, don't miss this now, they're not going to want to come to the place where God is. And now God gets the blame for our misrepresentation of him. Andrew isn't what I was expecting. He doesn't talk like the pastors I remember and feels like a typical young guy from South London. And the theme of his sermon, tolerance and acceptance. Because I, Andrew Aaron Asher Fuller, if you didn't know my name, that's my name. And me, I'm being honest, I have fallen so far from grace many a times in my life that I can't come to you and look down on you. Pastor Andrew is amazing, isn't he? Um, I don't think I've ever seen a, uh, a pastor that young speak to a, uh, a congregation this mixed. And he spoke to parents in a way that I've been speaking to my mum for years. <laughs> Uh, and I think it really resonated with people here. It's, um, it's pretty much done now, service is over, people are leaving and um, Pastor Andrew is uh, shaking everyone's hands. So I'm gonna get my hand shaken um, and maybe have a chat with him too. But everyone wants to shake Andrew's hand. So I grabbed the chance to have a quick word with the head pastor over lunch. Hello, hello. I've been told to come for some lunch. What do we have today? This looks amazing. Has no, have I the first person to come up? Has no one eaten yet? It's all right. You oh, no, 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 I can't be that one. guy. It's all right. Everyone, see, why would you send me there first? The whole room's no, hungry no, 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 no. and you send me up there and I'm like, yeah, where's my plate? We're going to sit down to and then we want to have some soup first. Right, we'll okay. Get some soup for us. Okay, got it, got it. If your daughter, for instance, were to come out, would you still have a relationship with her, do you think? You see, in terms, I think in the home setting, we have a clear understanding of what is acceptable. I may be able to point out to you, you are my child, I love you, but if they were to choose that lifestyle, then they wouldn't be able to live with us. You see, membership of the church is a privilege, not a right. When you become a member of the church, you are committing to a particular way of life that is informed by scripture. If you, along the way, choose to, 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 to live a life different from that, you can't be part of an Adventist faith community. So far, so traditional. But Pastor Michael is from an older generation and moved here from Kenya. Maybe the younger Pastor Andrew, who was born and raised in London like me, thinks like I do. Something that gets sort of whispered about in church, in, in my limited experience, and definitely in talking to religious friends that I have now, is attitude towards sex yeah. and issues like homosexuality. What do you believe? So I don't believe this, and this is saying that as blunt as possible, I believe we have to go to marriage. You know, I sincerely believe, you know, I've, I've, I've been in- Heterosexual, because gay people can get married now. And that's my point. The truth of the matter is, my sincere belief is that when I have a woman and a woman, and a man and a man, no hatred, no animosity, but I just don't believe that. 
mother and father are vital in society. So I, it's a traditional family setup. Yeah, I strongly in. believe that. You right. know, with all my heart, this is not half. No, I strongly believe that. Acceptance in this church, at least, only seems to go so far. The delivery might be different, but fundamentally, Andrew believes the same as his elders. Um, there's almost, <laughs> there's almost a slim to naught chance of you being accepted by the church if when you come to a church and your pastor is cool, he's got this pretty edgy, crazy background, he's in his 20s and even he can't get past that point. It's estimated that one in 10 people are gay in the UK and one in 300 are transgender, the T in LGBT. So if it's tough being black and gay, I can't help wondering what it must be like to be black and trans. I'm on my way to Burton-on-Trent to find out. I've never actually met a transgender person before and um, I'm really looking forward to meeting Tallulah and, uh, and hearing her story because, I mean, we're not exactly in the biggest of towns and in the biggest of cities, which instantly throws up its own issues, but as well as that, the fact that she's of mixed race and the fact her father is of Caribbean descent, I'm really keen to, to be educated on what her life is actually like. Hello, uh, yeah, hey, okay. how you doing? I'm good, Tallulah, thank you. nice to meet you. you too. Tallulah's parents separated when she was three. So she lives with her mum and Grandma Glennis, who is still coming to terms with a new granddaughter. Nice to meet you, Glennis. Yeah. Reggie. How is it having Tallulah as a house guest then? Oh, he's all right. She's all right, I should say. She still can't get to grips. I was going to say. It's very nice. It's and very, everything. very hard to what you've got to do. Yeah. Just get used to yeah, the, the pronouns and everything. Him, you know, Tallulah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, it's pretty hard to ignore the fact that there is <laughs> the entirety of your youth on this yeah. little shelf over here. My God, I was obsessed with that, me as a boy. That was about 15, I think, and that was literally just before I came out at school about my, at the time, the sexuality I was. Mm -hmm. um, so that's them two photos. That one was Sexuality me. you was? Yeah, because when I was at high school, I didn't really have a choice other than to, to come out as gay because there was no kind of education as to what being transgender was about, so nobody understood it. Mm -hmm. So my only option was to come out as gay because I was so feminine, so I had to come out as, as gay just so people would get off my back. Right. But at that point, you were attracted to, to girls or to no, guys? No, no, no. I've always been, in my head, a straight woman, but to everyone else at the time, because I was attracted, attracted to, to guys, everyone was just like, well, you must be gay. It was after I left school that I came out yeah. as transgender and started living as a woman. This is how I came out of being, about being just in a living my life paper. as a woman. Yeah. <laughs> so this is it. That's oh. me. All right, what tea you got? Can I get a brew on? A brew, yeah. yeah. See, this is a this is a massive indicator of how good a host you are, how good your brew is. I think I'm quite a good host. Oh really? Yeah. All right. Apparently Libras are because I'm a Libra. So what were you uh, what were you called before? You I was were, called Aaron training, before. Yeah. Aaron. Okay. <laughs> there we go. Oh. Don't be shy. Moment of truth, no pressure. That's a seven and a half out of ten. It's seven and a half? <laughs> no. <laughs> <It's> disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> I think oh, it's a ten. It's a really good ten. I'll, I'll, I'll give you it an eight. It may just be the water around here. You're not used to it. Where are we headed? To the garden. Now that we're away from her nan, there's one question I've been dying to ask Tallulah. Not to be massively intrusive, but you, you say that you're, you you haven't had your boobs done, but you no. seem yeah, fairly no <laughs> together in that area. Yeah. Um, so what, I mean, I'm what, on what hormones at the minute. I'm on hormones. My boobs are probably about an A, but I wear like a C bra and then stuff it with um, these sticky chicken fillet things. Right. Um, but yeah, it gives me quite a realistic bosom, I think. Yeah. So what kind of guys do you date now? Like, I always end up getting with white guys, but I always get approached more by black guys. So they'll say to me, oh, I'd go there with you in, like, in four years' time once you've had surgery, but I won't go with you now because you've got a dick. That kind of thing. Is there, a, is there a big black community here? I wouldn't say there's a big black community in Burton, but there is a black community, and it's very 
quite a hard thing for them to get their, their head around. Mm. It's very taboo, isn't it? On the drive up here, I realised just how Asian this area is. Yeah, There's a lot of Muslims very, and a lot of Sikh, yeah. Sikh people. I mean, how, how do they react to you? Not very well, to be fair. Like, I do get quite a lot of death threats from the Asian community. How do those and death threats come? Are they to your face, through the door? Oh, yeah, to my face down the street. I'll be walking down the street sometimes, I'll have bottle, bottles thrown at my head. I love people saying, oh, you fucking batty man, go die. Literally saying everything that, that you could think of to try and get a reaction out of me. And I just didn't, I just didn't give in. Why did you choose not to react to that? Just because I'd probably get beaten up if I was to react to it. Mm. And I can't really afford to have my face being broken. I'm not totally surprised Tallulah has had grief from some in the local Asian community. Some Muslims struggle to accept gay people let alone transsexual ones. Few are willing to talk about it on camera, but there is one online, and it turns out that he's gay himself. Homosexuality is okay and is not wrong. You can't change your sexuality, no matter what you do. The man in the video is Sahil Ahmed, a 23-year-old student from East London. Maybe he can shed some light on how his fellow Muslims view gay people. Have you always been in this, uh, this bit of town? Did you grow up around here? Uh, no, 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 I didn't grow up around here. I grew up uh, in uh, Waltham Forest. Okay. So like, I moved here like a year ago, mm. basically since kind of I moved out of my parents' house and stuff. At what age did you realise that you were, you were gay? Well, I mean, the age I realised I was gay was like literally last year, um, age of 22. So that's when I actually came out to myself. Yeah. And the reason why it took so long is because my religion taught me that being gay is not a thing. Yeah. I was pretty much born into actually a very kind of strict uh, form of Islam. You know, I was basically brought up believing that the West is, you know, the enemy, that the UK is at war with Islam. Even though you were living in yeah, the UK? Yeah, even though I was born here and I was living here. Yeah. And I was, I was just basically like, you know, all the non-Muslims are the enemy and that they wow. want to destroy Islam. And I really believe that. At your most extreme point, what would your view on homosexuality have been? Well, my view would have been that it's, it's disgusting, it's evil. And what you do to gay people is that you throw them off a a tall building and he stoned them to death. And I also kind of believe that I deserved being gay as a punishment from God because I'd done something evil in my life. Wow. All right, I'll be your basket man. Yes, thank you. You get what you need. Yeah. Sahil no longer practices his religion. Fridays used to be prayer day, but today he's having friends over instead. I think cookies are a good you idea, want cookies? right? Cool, yeah. go for it. There you go. He's forced to keep the location of his student flat a secret from his family. Coming out was just the beginning of his ordeal. What was it that um, made you decide to leave home? Basically, when, I, when my parents realised I, um, I was gay... Um, did they, they realise or did you tell them? They, the, way, the way they'd found out is that they'd... Um, using the, the router, they checked my internet history. <laughs> Um, and then when they checked that, they read, okay, um, he's, he's, into, he's into other guys. Um, and then, like... Conclusively. Yeah, yeah, conclusive. Um, so then basically, like, they called me back home and, and my dad basically said, I know the secret that you've been keeping from us. That was the most dreadful, fear-inducing moment in my life. He's my dad, but he believes that gay people should be killed. They should be stoned to death. Including his own son? Including my own including me, yeah. In, like, the Pakistani community, and there's a very strong shame factor. You know, there's a, the whole thing about honour. So, for example, my own mother said to me, um, if you murdered someone, I'd still accept you. But you being gay, I can't accept you for that. I can't accept that. Was there ever a conversation about curing your homosexuality? Did that ever happen? Oh, yeah, that was actually the, the main reason why I ended up leaving, leaving um, the house. They basically said, the only way you can stay in this house is if you agree to be exorcised, to get the, the demons out of you, because they were convinced that the reason why I'm gay and the reason why I was doubting religion mm. was because I was possessed. And for like the next two months, they would like, you know, recite the Quran over me, uh, make me bathe in holy water. At one point, I almost took my own life in my own in my room. That was when I decided, you know what, I can't stay in this house because if I stay here, I'm probably not going to be around for much longer. Sorry, they were out of champagne. Oh yeah. So we got. Jeez. <laughs> How's that work for you guys? So Hill moved into student accommodation. He hasn't spoken to his family for over a year. How important has this uh, circle of friends become to you? The reason why I'm here actually, like alive, 
is because of my friends. And if it wasn't for them, then I don't know where I'd be. But Sir Hill's past still haunts his future. Having sex right now is a bridge too far for me. Like I would be okay with like a, a kind of like a, a romantic relationship with another guy. Um, but having sex is something that kind of, I'm not sure if I'm ready to go into that. Um, if I see two guys together kissing or something, like I'll have like this emotional kind of immediate like homophobia. It's been so deeply indoctrinated in me from since childhood that it's just, it's hard for me to kind of weed that out and get rid of that and shake that kind of thinking off. I think the most surreal thing about Sahil's story is that it actually happened here in London. I'm flabbergasted that someone is having to go through an exorcism uh, because their parents are disgusted by their nature, by the fact that they're actually a homosexual person. He's now alone. He no longer has a connection to his family and, you know, the thing that seems most painful for him is losing that relationship with his mama and mother and his, and his younger siblings. That's just really sad all down to the fact that he is, he is being himself. Islam is the fastest growing religion in the UK. There are now over 1.5 million Muslims under the age of 25. With numbers like that, it's hard to ignore the influence Imams can have on young minds like Sahil's. We contacted over 200 mosques to find someone to speak with me on camera. And in the end, only one imam agreed. Muhammad is 29 and from Edinburgh, but he's having to meet me independently without the support of his mosque. So Muhammad, what are your beliefs when it comes to homosexuality? My beliefs are the same beliefs that my religions have. When it comes to these issues, obviously you go back to the sources that you have and you try to find your answers in it. Okay, so what would your answer be? Uh, I personally believe that it's an unnatural manifestation of a natural desire. Yep. In Islam, we are told that this is not something that can become a feeling. This is something that is unnatural. And if it's something that is in you, then you can tackle it, you can deal with it. What would you say the general attitude in your mosque is towards homosexuality? Honestly speaking, people don't speak about it. Uh, I've received some anonymous emails. They never mention their name, probably out of shyness. So you've had somebody at your mosque approach you about their own homosexual feelings. What was your reaction to that? If he really trusts Allah, if in his heart he has a feeling for Allah which is more stronger than any other feeling, then I will for sure tell him that as a man, as a straight man, I personally feel that I am attracted to every single beautiful woman. I have this urge. But just because of this urge, it is, is it justified for me to go after every single beautiful woman that I find attractive? You know the people who are kleptomaniac, they have the urge to steal. So you think it's an urge? I don't believe it's an urge, but it's something that he can control. In the month of fasting, for example, especially in the UK, for 21 hours you're not eating. And in the beginning you have struggles. You're struggling, but at the end of the month you find it very normal. I'm sorry to cut you, but you're comparing um, something like homosexuality to stealing and I'm not to, equating and, uh, it. I'm not equating it. No, 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 you're, you're comparing. You're comparing, comparing. comparing them to, it's just, to stealing it's, and to, and to, I'm, I'm and the about the, to eat. I'm, I'm talking about the physical things. So what would you do then if, you're, uh, if your son came home and told you that I've not been able to tell you this before, but I believe that I'm actually gay. How would you react to that? Either if he is confused, he should try, and he should see that if he can find peace and comfort or love in a woman. If he can't, then I will tell him that the only option that he has is to live a celibate life if he can. Scripture is one thing, but real life is another. And I think if you're living in the real world, you have to question some of the things that you're not only taught, but some of the things that have been left behind for you to learn from. But Muhammad's views are in line with all major Islamic organizations in Britain. And on these streets, some interpret those views in extreme ways. This is Whitechapel in East London. Uh, we're making a program for the BBC on uh, attitudes towards homosexuality. Do you want to be happy to chat about it on no, camera? No, no, no. Why not? No, not on camera, man. Why is that? No, no. <laughs> you sure? Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's a major sin in part, as far as Islam is concerned, but it doesn't take you out of the fold of Islam. Mm. So technically speaking, yes, you can be gay and be Muslim. What everyone does in their private homes is up to them. Yeah. You know, I'm not going to judge. Can you be gay and Muslim? I don't think so. Because if you're following a religion, you need to follow everything in that religion. If you are a Muslim, you cannot be gay. If you are gay, you cannot be Muslim. That's as simple as that. Being a Muslim, you can't be a gay or a lesbian. If you can't follow a very tiny rule, then you are not in in the religion. Have you got a couple minutes to chat to me on camera? No? 
Hello, mate, you got a couple minutes? I've heard some signs of tolerance on the minutes. street. Excuse me, sir, have you got two minutes to just chat to me on camera? No? But the Imam's line does seem to hold true for some Muslims, as the rest of Britain moves towards a greater acceptance of homosexuality. In 2007, less than half of the UK population backed gay marriage. Now, 60% are in favor. But support remains lowest among Asian and black men. And I don't think the reasons are just religious. It's really funny thinking about the relationship between uh, music and culture because they sort of they sort of blur, definitely in my experience anyway. Uh, and when it comes to the idea of misogyny and homophobia, particularly in black music, I I don't know, I sort of get quite I don't know, I get a little a little funny talking about it because whether I like it or not, the music that I love definitely in, uh, in, in bits of my past has, has reflected a view that, that makes me uncomfortable, if I'm totally honest. Growing up around these attitudes and these hit songs, it's not hard to see why so few black men come out in public. But Max, who I met at the barbers, has promised to show me where some young gay people do feel free to be themselves. Spartan Max. Hey. <laughs> Dear, man. Can we talk about the hat? Yeah, sure. What's the deal with the hat? What happens when the mask comes on? Well, that remains to be seen. Oh, no. Wow, okay. <laughs> I mean, what can you tell me about uh, a night like tonight? You've invited me down. What, what is this? Where are we? Well, we are at Urban World Pride. Events like this are special and important for young gay and lesbian people that are coming out simply because when they're at home, they may not necessarily feel comfortable letting their family or their friends know that they're gay, which effectively means that they have to hide who they really are. But when they come here, they can first find a Samaga family that will accept you for who you are because we're all the same, you know? Enough talking, time to see things for myself. It's unbelievable to witness this parallel world. There's guys daggering guys in there. If you know what daggering is, I mean, you can put that together yourselves, even if you don't know what it is. There are guys daggering guys in there. That doesn't happen. Well, clearly it does. It didn't happen in my world until today. Now, I mean, there's a Desi room up there. There is a room full of Asian men who I can't even get close to right now with the camera because they just don't want to be seen. And the reason that they don't want to be on camera is fairly obvious. There is so much paranoia, I mean, We've had to come here because literally whenever we pull the camera out, people are running in different directions. Do the thing that I hate people doing to me most, and that's talking to you while you're mixing. Sorry. I'm used to it. It's not right. Yeah, not. Uh, Reggie, nice to meet you, man. Yeah. And when it comes to our parents' generation, uh, homophobia was pretty much commonplace, and things are changing for the better, but there still is that weird energy towards homosexuality. And to be really honest with you, as a fan of black music, it is reflected in the music. It's there. It's hard to ignore. And you're playing black music all night. So how do those two worlds sort of go together? I think, for me personally, I grew up with reggae, bashman, dancehall. So whether or not I was, whether I was gay or not, it's part of my culture. I've grown up to those music. So take away the words, the music, the energy I get from the beats, I couldn't deny it. Do you get what I mean? So I'm not going to let things like Step on Chichi Man or any of those kind of lyrics really bother me. I'm there to dance. I don't care what they're talking about. Yeah. I know that certain people do have a problem with it, but I find it's more the white community that has problems 
with the words of the Bashman rather than. Yeah. The it's not just Bashman, don't get me wrong. Yeah. Hip hop can be homophobic. Hip hop as well, yeah. Dance hall can be homophobic. But like you said, it's a culture that we've grown up with. Yeah, I've grown up with that music. Does that make it okay? It doesn't make it okay, but there's a lot of things in the world that aren't necessarily okay, but. So you'll overlook it, you're saying? I'll overlook yeah. it. Right, what do you think the reaction will be then if you play an Elephant Man log on? In a club it like this, they would all start logging on. They do the dance, yeah. And would they ignore the step punches you man? Or would they actually yeah, do that? It's like sticks and stones will break your bones, like that kind of situation. It feels like Mark is trying to reclaim these songs. I'm struggling to find other gay men who will speak with me on camera. But Nicole, a 21 year old lesbian with a Jamaican dad, agrees. Thank you for uh, finding the time to chat to me. I That's appreciate right. it. Thank, Thank you, you for so having much. me. No, 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 no. It's all good. Thanks. So, do you think it's easier to be uh, a gay girl or a gay guy in London? I say it's hard to be a black gay man. I mean, according to my dad, it's immoral, it's wrong. Um, he sees it as if everybody in our generation is going to accept people being gay, then our generation, when we have kids, they're going to come back to us and tell you that we're sleeping with donkeys and we must accept it. In Jamaica, they see homosexuality as the white man's disease. The way I've been brought up, it still has an effect on my mind at times. I mean, much as I'm gay, I don't like the person here about two gay guys in their sex life. Like, for me, it just, it just it doesn't, doesn't feel right. But then I feel bad because I'm gay myself. So how can I be prejudiced with somebody else that's gay? Can you understand how, for someone like myself, that sounds absolutely mental? Because yeah. I'm sure the last thing that you want is for anyone to judge you or be prejudiced towards of course, you. Exactly. But it almost seems as though it's ingrained within you towards towards gay guys. It feels like that. And because I notice it, I feel so bad for it. But I can't help the way I think. I can help the way I act on it, but I can't help the way I think. Nicole is trying to deal with her own homophobia and she won't let it stop her coming to nights like this. They're just too important. When I first came out, I didn't know that there were so many black gay people in London. I thought the majority of them were in Soho, the majority of them were in the white community. But I came out and I came to a night like this and the whole club was full of pure black people and the majority of them were all gay. I was amazed. There is a bubble around that venue that people are walking into and it's safe. It's weird, like it's a bittersweet sort of thing. You come out of a night like tonight feeling really positive that there is somewhere for young black men to go, but at the same time you think, wow, there are a lot of people in 2016 who are still scared to be seen being who they truly are on camera. But one person who isn't afraid to be out is Tallulah. and she's keen for me to meet her dad. But first, hair. I think that one there. This, this one. This one. Yeah, that one. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> See? Look at me. <laughs> That's not too bad, actually, is it? Spice up your life. Yeah, a bit of your back out. <laughs> but, it would definitely show all of my Adam's apple. Like sometimes with my wigs, I get them really big and long so that I can kind of like disguise it from the side. Do you know what I mean? When you are shopping in here and you do see other black women, I mean, how do they react to you? I, they just stare a lot, they just look a lot and, um, and then they'll just whisper amongst themselves. They'll be like, oh my God, that's a man. They'll be like, oh my God, really? Ha no, it's not. And then they'll be like, yeah, look, look at her throat. Mm. And then they'll be like, listen, listen, listen. And then that, that's the kind of whispering it is. Mm. How far away from being who you want to be do you think you really are? Um, I'm a long way, because I've only just started my transition. So it's like four years on the waiting list, unless I can get 12 and a half grand together to have my vaginal plastic and five grand to have my boobs and two and a half grand to get this done, then I'm a very long way. Tallulah is confident no one will be able to tell she once was a man when all the surgery is done including a vaginoplasty. It looks so good, how they do it. Like, it literally looks like a normal vagina. And, um, yeah, but the recovery is really long. It's about six months in recovery. You have to sleep with a dildo inside you for six months as well. Yeah, to stop it from healing. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah. 
Surely there's another way of doing that. No, there's no other way. Otherwise, it's just going to heal back together, isn't it? Because it's man made. It's like a scar or a cut or a wound. A long time. But, um. Yeah, Some people will probably be into that. Yeah, at least it'll be quite <laughs> deep. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not built. I'm not mature enough to have this conversation. Yeah. <laughs> Tallulah's dad, Simon, has flitted in and out of her life. He lives in nearby Derby with his new partner. <laughs> How are you? You're all right. How are you? How you doing? You good? Great, yeah, nice Hello. to meet you. Hello, nice you okay? Meet you. <laughs> Simon, right? Yes. How are you? How are you doing? You all right? Yeah, you? Yeah, okay. Hello. How are you? Hello, Reggie, nice to meet you. Hi. How are you doing? What's your name? Uh, Simon, Tulu was just telling me that you haven't seen each other in a long time. Long, long, yeah. <laughs> You're something good, didn't you? <laughs> yeah. Do you want to come through? Uh, yeah, yeah, please. Yeah. Simon has spent the last four years behind bars. So did you find out when you were actually inside? <laughs> I'm yeah. sitting now reading in the newspaper, and um, a guy was commenting, he's like, Flipping out, goes, look at these, look, it looks real, who doesn't look real in that, yeah? So he was just looking, <laughs> and every single person was like, nah, she's a real, she's a real woman. That, no, he may, mm, he's got a bit of a chin and whatever, you know what I mean? <laughs> so, um, I looked and I just went... <laughs> you know, that's, yeah, that's my kid. He's like, yeah, apparently. I'm like, that's my kid. I thought to myself, I wonder if it's my fault for not being there. See, everyone sees it as a fault, don't they? No, no, no. Everyone I'm thinks about, it's, on, on it's behalf, parenting like, I was, gone I was wrong. looking at it in a way where I think to myself, I wonder if that's because I wasn't around much. So she's she's grown up around her mum, um, April. Yeah. Uh, she's, she's grown up around a lot of women. Mm. And I'm just thinking to myself, maybe if I was there more, would she have wanted to be more of a masculine person? And do you still think that way now? No, not at all. I'm really surprised at your reaction. What it is is my parents are like old-fashioned Jamaican. Christian background, Christian beliefs. So that's the beliefs that I was brought up with. But because I grew up in like areas which is predominantly white, like I was in boarding school and there's only two black people ever been to that school ever. So you know how it feels to be different. So yeah, so to be segregated and to be treated different from other people, mm. I understand that as well. Yeah. You know, it's, it's it all rolls into one. That, that sort of helped me understand why she's the way she is. At the end of the day, what it boils down to is how a person feels comfortable. Yeah. And the other thing is, I mean, she, she's my blood, so... Were you surprised at your dad's reaction? I was, because I've been judged so much by the black community as it was, I thought, well, my dad's just going to be another one. Simon, thank you so much for having me. Not a problem. It's been a real pleasure meeting you, yeah. and um, thank you for having me in your home. <laughs> and look, best of luck thank with you. everything. Um, yeah. Hopefully get to see you again soon. Yeah, definitely. Come to Pride on, on the 12th, which is in Derby. There's a Derby Pride? Yeah. It's a date, I will see you then. Yeah, definitely. Lovely to see you. Thanks again, yeah. all right? Bye. Take, Take care, guys. Tallulah's dad really surprised me today, given his history and their distant relationship. There is nothing stereotypical about Simon's views. I never thought he would be so accepting. And so, I can't help but think about Sahil, who I met at the start of my journey. He too is still coming to terms with his sexuality, but he's doing it alone, without his mum or dad. So I'm inviting him to join me at Pride next week. Let's hope there are no Muslim anti-gay protesters there as it wouldn't be the first time. Just doing a teeny bit of research, there hasn't actually been a march as part of Derby Pride in quite a few years because the last time a march happened uh, in 2012, people were arrested. There were uh, people protesting, there was hate speech. Some actually held placards which um, had things written on them such as homosexuality equals freedom gone too far. Homosexuality equals a crime against God, and uh, Islam is the ultimate truth. Um, things such as scum were screamed, uh, gays will go to hell, which just sounds <laughs> ridiculous to me. I mean, here we go, look, gays, 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 we hope you die of AIDS. To think that grown men were actually chanting this and thought that it was acceptable to me is mind-blowing. This is happening in the UK, not 30 years ago, three years ago. One of the Muslim protesters was successfully prosecuted for using abusive language.
I'm on my way to Derby to attend my first ever gay pride with Tallulah. And I really hope that Sahil shows up. No, I desperately want Sahil to come today because I think him being one of many, being part of the majority uh, and not feeling different would be an incredible thing for somebody like him who's only been out a year. But he's just not taking my calls. I suddenly feel like a really annoying, angry girlfriend chasing someone down. <laughs> So the chances are he's changed his mind about coming. How's that for timing? How are you? Hello, are you okay? You? you look great. <laughs> Thank you. All but right. I thought I'd make a bit of an effort. Yeah. With it being my hometown pride. Exactly. This will actually be my, uh, my first ever pride. And I'm sort of looking around because I was expecting to see a little bit of, more yeah. sort of celebration. We're well, not this in town just yet. Right. But when we get into town, you'll probably see it all more. Yeah. We might have to walk down here first to get down there. It is today, isn't it? <laughs> it's definitely today, right? Yeah, well, it should be. It's, it's this way. So. This, this is, this is it. We're here, right? Yeah, this is it. This is the it's not massive, tiny is it? community <laughs> yeah. in, in Derby. Right. This isn't what I was expecting at all. Um, one thing I was expecting was to be here with Sahil and to um, to see this through his fresh eyes as well. Um, but he's not here. He still isn't responding, and um, I'm starting to really believe he's not going to turn up today, which is a shame. But at the same time, I mean, just sort of looking around, in a weird way, I can understand why he might not necessarily feel that he fits in, even here. Because, I mean, it's a very white pride, isn't it? <laughs> and outside of myself and Tallulah, there's one other person of colour here. So, definitely, uh, Tallulah is a minority, within a minority, within a minority today. In Derby, almost one in five people are black or Asian. So if one in 10 people are gay, by rights, in Derby alone, there should be 5,000 homosexual men and women of color. It seems like there's a lot of people stopping to watch. Yeah, they're here. What do you think they're thinking? They're probably thinking, wow, what colorful people. <laughs> Although I spot many black and Asian faces in the crowds of shoppers, they're just here to watch, not take part, until I spy just one other person of colour actually marching. Excuse me, sorry to interrupt. One of the most interesting things I've found about today is how few Afro-Caribbean or ethnic minority people there are at Pride. Why do you think there's such a small number? Because it's literally, what, four people? Three people? <laughs> I counted. Yeah. yeah, I counted you. But oh, there's another one, a fresh one. So what would the uh, the, the West, your West Indian, the, uh, the black side well, of your yeah, family, right? Yeah. What mean? would that attitude be towards your sexuality? Well, to be honest, I am, I'm not with that part of the family, but from experience of what I've seen, I think it would be total rejection, yeah. totally. Uh, meanwhile, from the, uh, the white side of your They're family? They're a bit more tolerant, a lot more, in fact. Why is that? I think white people are. They think they're not, but they are. Derby Pride is now in full swing. Come let me hear you scream! And I get talking to the Asian man I spotted earlier. Hello. Hey, how you doing? All right, thank you. I'm Reg, what's your name? I'm Wahid. Wahid, nice to meet yeah. you. OK, not to pry, but uh, I take it you are a, a gay man yourself. Are you a Muslim? Gay man? Bisexual. Bisexual. Why do you think that you're the only Asian man here today? People are scared about me. I mean, even I'm here because I don't care anymore. I'm over 60, I had my life, so I don't care what people think about. Maybe this is why Sahil and other black and Asian people have stayed away. Too much to lose, too much to fear. Whilst Derby Pride might not have been as big as I expected, there's also been no opposition. So it's almost time to leave Tallulah and prepare to head home. But not just yet, it's Sahil. I thought you weren't coming. Well, I'm here now. Come here. 
good to see you. Good to now, see you too. this is the first time I've ever been to a Pride event. Yeah. Have you ever been to one before? I've never been to one before. This is my first time as well. Right. Yeah. What do you think? It's amazing. It's absolutely like the the kind of like atmosphere. Like, yeah. have you ever been around this many people who are out before? Never. Like, even most of my friends, like my friend circle, most of them, uh, they're straight. Just how comfortable do you feel in an environment like this? I feel, hmm, it's, I do feel very much out of place, to be honest with you. Why? Because, like, I don't want people to, I, I know people will be looking at me and be like, wait, is this guy here to blow us up or <laughs> what? Do you really it's, think people No, 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 I, I mean, I mean, to be fair, I mean, how often do you see, like, a guy with a beard who looks like a proper Muslim, who is a Muslim, um, in like an LGBT pride event. Like, now I'm here with you, with you guys. Um, and that's, that's, that's like, that's fine. Um, but alone, I, I wouldn't stay here very long. Yeah, all right, Sahil is convinced everyone sees him as a Muslim first and a gay man second. But is that really true? So I've just stepped away, thinking the hill's gonna follow me out. But he stayed in there, and it looks like the hill is having the time of his life. And I think he might have made some friends. Go on, the hill. One second, I'm just gonna let you see what's it. Come here, you. Like you're having a time of your life. I, I am. I wasn't expecting this. So you look like you made some new friends. Yeah, I did. I I, uh, I wasn't like kind of expecting to stay here very much like after like. But what happened? Yeah. Like what you're gonna stay? Yeah, I wasn't. I wasn't planning on it, but now I am. Yeah, yeah. So you're gonna hang back and you're gonna yeah. have a night out in Derby. Yeah. Pretty much, yeah. You. Yeah. <laughs> Based on what you told me in the past about how you feel and how you reacted to gay people, being in an environment like this. Now feeling the way you do about yourself, how are you reacting to men holding hands and men kissing? Um, I've had this residual homophobia in me for a long time, um, but now today here, I'm not sure if I still have it, but it kind of hasn't reared its head. Listen, enjoy your night, have fun, yeah, yeah. and uh, get back in one piece. All right. I will. <laughs> Come on, get I'll in try, there. I'll try. Get I'll in try. there. Get in there. Go on. Take care. See you later. He's this close to running back. <laughs> to experience my first ever Pride with Sahil was awesome because it was his first time uh, at a day like this and his journey has taken a massive, massive leap in a, in a positive direction I think today. He really is embracing who he truly is and he is not suppressing it anymore and that can't be anything but positive. Now on the other hand, the, the negative side to today, I think, was that an event like this didn't really have many people that looked like me there. Um, to be exact, I think it was maybe four. It says a lot about how comfortable people like me feel to be who they truly are publicly. <laughs> 